Welcome to Principles of International Relations. In today's class, we will go a little bit away from this um, theoretical aspect which we had uh, um, before, talking about grand theories like um, like realism, liberalism, and cons uh, uh, constructivism, and rather go to a more more concrete, more kind of narrow topic, and that is the idea about conflict and wars. So for a very long time, uh, scholars have asked themselves, why do conflicts um, occur and why do they escalate, especially into wars? So we want to kind of highlight this idea a bit more and um, pay a special, uh, especially attention to some ideas of James Fearon, who who kind of noted comes from a from a rationalist uh, or a rationalist perspective, saying under like if countries are rational actors, um, wars are should very rarely occur because they are making all the actors involved worse off, and so always there should be a negotiation solution possible within a situation of a conflict. Um, I think this is a really intriguing uh, idea, quite interesting, because it doesn't really kind of um, discuss uh, conflict uh, uh, from a moral perspective, but also doesn't take it as a given that it exists, but rather kind of looks at the logic behind it and sees, like, uh, asks the question, why do countries um, lead wars and what's in for them? Um, of course, uh, I think also that is, is general idea that uh, fighting a war rather than negotiations is, is uh, negotiating outcomes is, is, is not rational, is very interesting. But of course, we will also see um, um, that there are certain conditions uh, when this does not apply and even rational actors will kind of uh, mm, uh, go uh, uh, kind of be, be led into into military conflicts and wars. So, um, without further ado, I hope uh, I will go right into the slides, and I hope you, you will enjoy uh, this lecture. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope um, you will enjoy this class. I think it's a quite interesting one, especially um, because. It leads us right into the field of um, of um, understanding the current uh, streams of research which are done in international relations uh, research. So in a way, we are coming here from this. Uh, we are starting here from this idea of fearing that wars are not necessary. And I will just de uh, define in a second why this is the case. Um, and then we will work out what all the implications of uh, conflict um, and all the implications of war have on outcomes for 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 governments. Um, so I think this is um, this is um, a real kind of uh, start in kind of for you to understand how research is done in the field of international relations. And I hope you will enjoy it. So if we kind of look back and say like, okay, what is the outline? How can we kind of um, deal with this topic, I think we can um, kind of provide several different um, um, different aspects. The first one is just asking the questions, why do states go uh, to war? That's something which is often assumed to be like a last resort, um, is combined with the idea of conflict of interests, all of these kind of different things. But it's not really understood why governments do that and why um, states actually have an incentive to fight means loss of life, destruction, etc. So that's the first question I want to answer. The other one is then, why do we have some conflicts which seem very severe and we don't necessarily have, um, uh, have a, an escalation towards a war, while in other situations we do and we find find that the, that the countries start fighting over certain goods. Is this just a matter of how severe these conflicts are? Is it a matter of the countries? Maybe some countries are more willing to fight than others. What's the real reason for that? And so I want to take 
this uh, question apart as well and kind of try to understand where we are coming from here. Uh, one big aspect in understanding why actually fighting occurs is this idea about trust. So why, uh, what happens if states do not trust each other? Why is this complicating things? Why is it becoming more difficult to resolve conflict if trust is not available? Very often, of course, within conflict, we find that trust is not there, but there might be also some other ways around it, like finding external uh, ways uh, to provide trust or mediation and other forms. So um, I want to highlight here the central form of uh, the central importance of trust. The last point, uh, which I think is also a kind of a reason why wars are happening, even though they should maybe not happen, is this idea of compromise, is it always possible? And the way how we think about this is very much like some things can be compromised on or can be divided in a certain way, other things cannot. So the, really, the reason here is I want to show you that there are certain factors which cannot be uh, divided well, and therefore compromise is really difficult. Okay, let's go into this. In a way, we can see wars from a very pers um, strategic perspective. And that is the way which a lot of international relations theorists are kind of approaching uh, a war and, uh, and also how fear and James fear and this kind of thinking about, about the occurrence of war. So in a way, we have this absence of a hierarchy, which is kind of um, determining who is right and wrong. We had talked about this in the kind of the anarchy of the states. And we understand that government states have to protect their citizens, their countries in order to um, in order to kind of succeed in the world because there's no kind of higher level who is able uh, to protect uh, countries. But this doesn't necessarily kind of explain why wars are happening. So very common understanding is that wars occur if bar bargaining or negotiations fails. And therefore, a peaceful settlement uh, is not uh, available. So in a way, let's say there's a conflict over territory say, um, between country A and country B. Country A wants to have an island. Country B is in possession of the island, but doesn't want to give it up. They can be given hundreds of different reasons, historic, ethnic, um, strategic, all kinds of reasons can be given why country A would like to have this country, uh, this, 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 this island. But in this way, um, first, what we expect to see is a negotiation process. That means that a country A is telling country B that it actually would like to have this territory, saying like, okay, please give us this territory. Historically, it has always belonged to our, uh, our country, and um, so please give it back. Then at the same time, the other country can decide whether they can fulfill uh, these demands or not. But what happens if country A would like to get the territory and country B does not want to give it up? So we could maybe find some other forms of negotiation outcome. Maybe there is some kind of payment going on or preferred trade agreements or all kinds of different settle, uh, ways of settling this kind of conflict. So we don't have to see it as a very narrow kind of perspective where it's only about uh, settling in terms of uh, the territory goes to A or to B, but rather lots of other things can be. Um, but in a way, maybe states can be uh, are unable to find negotiation settlement. That can be that they don't find a real reason why not. So the argument generally is then that peace can break down if these kind of these states cannot commit to to terms of an agreement. Um, and there's another reason that maybe it is hard, this kind of specific good is hard to divide and it's not, not possible, for example, like oil resources or other things, which cannot be kind of easily divided. So in this way, the important thing which we have to see is that war is not necessarily a state by itself. It's rather the failure of some other events, namely the failure of the, or the breakdown of negotiations between different actors, 
so between different countries in this way. So kind of actress stands in this way. Uh, how, throughout this lecture today, uh, the name actor will be used synonymous with country or state. So in a way, we have to see war as the failure of the bargaining process then, uh, rather than something unique by itself. So if we kind of think about this kind of modeling, this, uh, this, this kind of situation of war, um, in a way, there is like, from a realist perspective, um, countries will fight in order to prevent any enemy to succeed. So they will fight in order to, uh, for, for the other enemy to be uh, successful. So in a way, if you think about the world as this kind of anarchy of states, um, then we can say that military forces are the, the way uh, uh, are used in order to kind of keep um, the interests of these states, or maybe to keep the interests uh, um, or keep uh, uh, threaten other countries which are um, uh, thinking about violating these kind of interests. So in a way, this is very much like seeing uh, realists very much see the world as a bargaining situation in this way. It's not that institutions are kind of providing this, but rather your own strengths and your skills and kind of convincing the others that it's not a good idea to start a conflict with you. However, there is some real problem for realist theory. So generally until now, this is all in accordance with realist theory. Realists say like, okay, this, um, international relations are a bargaining process. We have anarchy of the states. So it is likely that actually conflict occur. And if this cannot be resolved, then war happens. But there is one problem with this. And that's what I call the departure from realism. Military power is costly. Or using military power is especially costly. So states are always better off not fighting wars. Why is that the case? Well, because a war, first of all, costs very often loss of life, which is uh, which is tragic and very bad for countries as well. Um, so it is bad for the individuals. It's bad for the general kind of the perception of the countries. But it's also bad even for um, for elections, etc. But we know from the United States, for example, if lots of um, uh, military personnel is kind of lost in the fight abroad. We see that this is having a big impact on the, on the successful perception of the, of the government in place. So it is costly to have loss of life, but it's also costly in other terms, in terms of um, loss of territory, well, in terms of um, loss of, of military, military cap uh, capability. So there's lots of destruction going on. So so also um, destruction of industries, for example, destruction, uh, economic destruction, a destruction of, um, of materials like weapons, like all these kinds of things. So many kind of different factors of, uh, of costs are incurred in a situation of war. The real problematic uh, issue there is that these kind of costs are lost. So it's not like if you have it in a transaction, like saying like a buying selling situation where one is buying and the other is selling that you have an exchange of goods but in a military in a, a conflict actually there is a loss of something and that is true to fighting fighting creates always these kind of loss and so in a way this is a very crude and maybe not very good um uh, comparison but if you think about you and your brother or your sister, uh, both wanting to have the last piece of cake. So there are different options you can go about it. You can kind of discuss who wants it more. You can think about a way to share it. Or both of you could grab the last piece of cake and try to stuff it in your mouth as quickly as possible. What we do know from the last option, this could be like similar to a situation of war where you're just grabbing something and want to get it as much as possible. But this is normally not a great situation. Why? Because you are actually, you have to eat it very fast. You can't enjoy this cake very much. And always there will be some kind of thing spilled by maybe the pieces breaking off and falling on the floor 
or more generally, maybe some kind of crumbs are uh, existent, which uh, can't be eaten anymore. So in a way, you can see military conflict in the same way as this fighting over a, a piece of cake. It will not, by, by the pure fact that you will fight over, you will have certain levels of destruction. And this kind of destruction will lead to the benefit of what you're fighting over will be reduced in, to, uh, in total. Does this make sense to you? So this is really a, one of the, um, of the key ideas to take away, that every war is costly, and therefore we need to kind of, um, therefore situations which are not involving war are generally beneficial for all actors. And that's something which, uh, which um, uh, James Fearon has noted in, in his work, is that net, war is not necessarily the, the natural progression of a conflict. So if you can't resolve it, you just kind of go over to war. Because you should always have something which is beneficial, which is a better solution uh, over fighting a war. Why? Because wars are costly and the outcome are, in any case, um, less beneficial than what you would could, uh, could have had from a negotiation outcome if you did not fight a war. So that's a really important part. So if since you have always costs over fighting, there should always be a better negotiation outcome possible for the actors to achieve. Why? Because the costs could, uh, which are used for war fighting a war could be offset in one direction or the other. So let me, before I go into the, the kind of describing this in a more um, maybe conceptual way, um, could I get back uh, to, uh, to this from a, um, to kind of make you understand the se several components of, of this situation of bargaining. The first one is what is called a set of player. So what we use here is um, we use two different countries um, to kind of visualize um, how such conflicts um, could occur. Um, players is the where, word which is normally used in game theory to kind of see uh, who is kind of playing this specific uh, situation. But it's not like a normal player. You could kind of, again, see it synonymous to the word actor or in our case here, synonymous to the word state. So we have a set of states. So two states, state A and state P in this case. We have some form of research which needs to be divided. So this could be, as I said before, maybe an island. It could also be some kind of conflict over other forms of territory in, let's say, like some oil fields, or it could also, or um, it could also be some in, in any kind of conflict which needs division um, could be the source which are uh, which uh, is divided here so it doesn't need to need to be territory very often it is kind of considered territory um, but it's not um, it could be anything uh, else which uh, a war breaks out over In a way, if you kind of think about bargaining, what we have is very often something called the rules about uh, of uh, the rules of the game or the rules of the bargaining. In this way, this is not um, such an important aspect. Why? Because in conflict negotiations, which might lead to war, normally they are very simple rules. But what we know, what we see is that there is one, uh, maybe one country which is offering something let's say it's offering a solution and another country which cannot ups, um, accept this offer, reject it or amend it in certain ways. And so in a way we have these kind of two players making offers and counter offers. One of the key aspects, and that is very kind of analog to what we think about in from uh, from a realist perspective is the is this idea about power so the power distribution between these two actors is really important and it's really important to understand 
um, the concept along these lines of power. And then there's, of course, the factor costs. And I just mentioned that every war has costs. And Fearon is kind of really uh, focusing on this idea that every war has costs. But um, so we can see this as the cost of war, or we can see it as the cost of bargaining breakdown. So if war is inevitable when bargaining is breaking down, we can also see this as the costs afterwards. So in this way, this is the kind of the definitions we have to make in order to understand uh, negotiations uh, and, and, and the bargaining, which can might lead to war. So let me kind of show this on a, on a scheme. And here I would like you to look at the first, um, the first uh, game up here. So, so you see this one here. So we have on the very left point, we have a point A, and then the very B, uh, uh, right point, we have a point B, right? Along this one, I would call it maybe a dimension, one dimension. So we have to see this as, um, let's say, how much from a cake you want to get. So on the very left point, B gets all of the cake. Yeah, so it get, they get it from here all the way g -g 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 until here. This is the B's ideal point. Why is it B's ideal point? Because then everything goes to country B. So all the way to, to the end of A. The same thing is true for the other way. So if we go from this point further, further, further to the end of the line here, that's A's ideal point. Why? because A would get all the possible outcome of it. So all the piece of cake, if you want. So like the whole distance is basically the best um, the both players or actors could get. So from A all the way to the other side is the best for, for actor A. From B to the other side is the best for actor, actor B. What I have here in the blue, and in red are, let's say, the situation before a conflict would happen. Yeah, let's say this is the situation, how the territory is divided at the moment. And so the division is called at the point X. So everything which is blue is going to which actor? Yes, you're right, to actor A. So everything in blue is kind of owned by actor A. Everything is red is owned by actor B. Why? It's kind of from this point on, further, 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 further till this point X. This all belongs to a actor B or state B in this, uh, in this case, because we're talking about two states. So now think about this. Which of these two actors, um, assume that Actor A is not happy with the solution. Actor A has actually considerably less in this situation and wants to have more territory. Maybe also became stronger in the last years and therefore is kind of demanding more uh, territory. So they can kind of ask themselves, um, what would happen if we do fight a war? Let's say we are strong enough, we can find a war. How much territory would we get? And here the important part is that normally the assumption is not that necessarily there is a winner and a loser of the war and the winner gets all and the loser gets nothing. And historically, this is a situation which is hardly ever existent, but rather that there will be some kind of settlement. And in this kind of settlement, we will have that some of the perks go um, to the one country and some of the perks go to the other country. The one who wins, of course, or who is on the winning side of the war is, um, is getting much more than the one of, uh, who is on the losing side. So if we kind of think about this, we have here, we look at the middle game. And we have the same kind of situation. So A's ideal point is still here. B's ideal point is still here. The blue part is still what actor A gets, and the red part is still what actor B gets. But we don't have this point X anymore, which is here, but we rather have a point P. So what should this be definition of the, what is this kind of point P? Well, point P is the expectation of what 
an outcome of a war would be. Does that make sense? Well, it is like if not necessarily when you fight, but before you fight, you have an expectation what the outcome would be. And this point B is how much you expect to get from fighting a war. And what we see here is A is stronger than B. So A would win more territory than B. So A gets something more than B gets. And so overall, the blue is becoming considerably bigger in this situation and the red is becoming considerably less and less big. So what would you think? But does it make sense for B, for A to fight a war? I would say yes, of course. Why? Because they actually get more out of it than, and therefore they are, it's beneficial to fight this war because the situation how we have it at the moment is not so good for them. What about B? Well, B doesn't want to fight a war. B wants actually to keep the situation how it is at the moment, but maybe that's not an option. So it could be that this is the ideal situation for actor B, but it's not an option because A wants to have some change and is willing to fight for it. However, now we come in this kind of third threading below there, we come to this idea that the, the last, the bottom uh, thing is that we bring into this, uh, this idea by James Fearon that every war is costly. Yeah, you remember that. And both sides will have costs of fighting a war. No matter whether you win or lose, you will have costs because you will lose lives, you will lose equipment, your, your, your civil um, population might be harmed, lots of different reasons for this. Yeah. So what in, in kind of modeling this situation, what do kind of scholars do? They kind of take the point P, how we have it here, and it's a bit moved, but don't be disturbed. It should be at the same point actually like then here. Yeah, this should be at the P should be this is the same in the second game than to the third game. But that's not what they what the two countries will get from the outcome of the war. That's actually just how the, the good will be divided. But we have to reduce the outcome of the war by the costs of this war. Right? So because these costs are actually kind of endured and they are kind of a loss for both sides. So for A, the benefit of winning this territory is actually just at this point. So that's P minus the costs. For B, it's the same thing. So it's also P minus the costs. So what you can see here is that actually A gets much, uh, quite a bit less than they would get with a war and maybe even less than they would have at the moment. Maybe the same, but maybe less, yeah. For the same time for A, this is actually more severe because with P, they would have got already less than they have at the moment. But with the cost of fighting a war, they even have much less. So they have here a big chunk less than they had before. So what Fearon thinks is that A and B, these kind of costs could be avoided. So we could have actually more to share. So somewhere in this area between, in this wide area in between here, we should find a solution for a negotiation outcome. Because even if we fight a war, we will have a less um, uh, um, positive situation. Yeah. So if we go like from P to the right, this is not a great situation for country, uh, for state, state B. Why? Because it cuts actually into their territory even more. If we go to the left, it's not such a great situation for A because they will get less um, than they've got from a war. However, each situation of all, of all of them in the white area are preferred to fighting a war because if you reduce the kind of the outcome by the costs, you will kind of get less. A, a B will get just this and A will just get this. So both countries like to have a negotiation outcome in this area. Not just A, not just B, both countries. 
I hope that makes sense. So this area here, I said it, is called the bargaining range. Yeah, because both countries prefer to have an outcome in this, um, both countries will like to prefer negotiation outcome here. And fear and actually kind of points to this area and says like, even if the costs are very high for a war, that actually increases this kind of bargaining outcome, uh, uh, this bargaining range, and should make it more likely for wars to, um, um, to not exist. But the important point here is that this is not only kind of preferred by the losing party, it's also preferred by the winning party because they also don't endure costs. We can and maybe discuss this in our class, but also just generally, just some thought for you. What if both countries have nuclear weapons? How costly would it be to actually fight a war over them? Would it be very costly or not so costly? Well, it would be very costly, right? And therefore, this kind of range of the green range would increase considerably. So actually, what we find is if um, countries have very sophisticated weapon system is that they have more range to find an agreement. And that is kind of uh, um, in line with the idea of nuclear deterrence theory. OK. In a way, in this kind of bargaining situations, we have to kind of be aware of certain things. In a way, this bargaining situation doesn't imply the idea of give and take. Yeah? So it's not some kind of compromise where you get a little bit less and therefore you are kind of um, you keep the harmony or any kind of things like this. It is really about getting the maximum out of it, but avoiding the costs of fighting a war. So it's not that the countries don't want to fight a war. It's really that they want to avoid the cost of it. So in a way, it can be a situation which is kind of really negative for the country, but it's still better for it um, to kind of find a bargaining outcome than to fight because the fighting would just add worst situation, right? So just think about this as you've, you are walking down a dark alleyway in a country far, far away um, where um, and suddenly somebody comes, jumps out and has a, um, and tries to rob you, right? In this situation, and you see that the other person has a gun, yeah? So in this situation, you have two ways of, uh, of reacting. You can either give the person all the money you have, or you can fight them. Uh, if you fight them, it is very likely that they still get your money. They might shoot you or do your other forms of harm, and then they can still kind of get your money. But for you, it's a worse situation to fight and give away your money than just giving away your money because your life is threatened as well with this kind of gun. For the other side, it's actually also worse. It's not that they get harmed by you, but if they shoot you, they're in higher risk to go to prison and uh, and also maybe some other consequences and uh, etc. And they have also a risk that you hit them when you kind of attack them. So for them, it's also the worst situation to fight you. Yeah. So in a way, we should see this bargaining is not necessarily finding a good outcome, which everybody is happy with, but rather kind of avoiding to have even a worse outcome. In a way, uh, that's uh, the second point here. In many cases, states assume all or nothing is something which, uh, which we have, um, which, which I kind of alluded already earlier to. And that's the idea that a war always leads to one winner, one loser, and the winner gets all and the loser gets nothing. And that's not the case. Even if you kind of see like conflicts like um, the Second World War, what we do have is at the end, we have very much an agreement, like a, a, a um, kind of a talk where, where ceasefires are agreed to and um, certain conditions are applied to the winning or the losing party. 
And so that's something which we have in almost all wars is that a conflict at one point, um, the, the losing party is actually kind of conceding and giving up and therefore saying, accepting the conditions of the winning party. Um, um, to, to kind of end the war. But the winning party is also not kind of continuing to fight because the, the cost of continuing to fight would be much higher than what they could gain from it as well. So we do have a, a conflicts normally lead to an end of conflict where there is some kind of out bargaining outcome uh, existing. There's also something uh, which is slightly different and it's coercive bargaining under the threat of war. Um, so we do see this, that um, there's the threat of war. And countries say like, if you don't give me this and this and this, we have no way other than fight you. And this is something which is of course, um, in terms of a bargaining strategy, something very favorable for them because they can allude to more negative outcome in case um, they are uh, things are not changed. Um, so just to go back to this um, example of being threatened by somebody with a weapon, if the other person is not having a weapon and not looking particularly dangerous, for example, um, you would react very differently. You would probably not give them all your money. Why? Because you think the consequences are not so bad. So alluding, having the weapon, alluding to kind of using force, is something which is beneficial for negotiations. So very frequently we see countries uh, using the threat of fighting, but not necessary. in the same time, it's not necessarily rational for them to actually start the fighting. Um, so in a way, some kind of research is going into this last point of compellence and deterrence so that we can use um, that military, the, the the kind of threat of military force is used to kind of change the perception of the others and also to deter them from taking certain actions. So the most famous one here is the nuclear deterrence. So having nuclear weapons, of course, gives you a huge leverage over the, the harm you can do to the other country. So in this way, finding is fighting a war would be extremely costly and uh, this kind of weapon is very efficient in terms of deterring other countries from starting a war with you. That's, for example, one of the reasons why North Korea is very eager to kind of get nuclear weapons, because it would reduce the threat um, from being kind of toppled over by uh, outside forces uh, considerably. So, in a way, let me kind of explain this in a more technical sense here, what compellence and what uh, deterrence is. So the compellence can be seen as the effort to change the status quo through a threat of force. Yeah. So for example, stop doing something or else we will fight for you. Yeah. So for example, it could be that um, a country says, stop getting close to our island with your military boats or we'll start shooting at your military boats. Uh, deterrence is exactly the opposite of it. And it says like an effort to preserve the status quo through a threat of force. Yeah. So in this way, you are actually kind of saying like that the others should not do something because uh, you would use force otherwise. So the compellence is an example where you say you want to have a change of the of the actions of the others, and if this change doesn't happen, you would use a force. Uh, deterrence is exactly the opposite that you don't want to do the others to do something, but if they would do, you would use force. Yeah. One of the examples then what Fearon talks about is that. Um, so, so basically what he comes, sorry, uh, what he comes here to is that we do have always these range of bargaining outcomes. So we should always, no matter what kind of conflict now, how severe it is for one country or the other, we should always find a solution, a bargaining solution, which is preferential for um, both sides. So in a way, this kind of the, the fear effect that costs are available mm -hmm. makes it 
prefer, um, preferable for both countries to find some outcome which is negotiated rather than over uh, than rather than fighting wars. So if we kind of take this um, this idea further, we would need to assume that well, if this is the case, no wars should ever happen. Why? Because there's always better negotiation outcome. And at the same time, this is always because of the cost, it's always preferred to uh, by, uh, by both sides. And therefore, we should not experience any wars. But is this the case? Well, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, unfortunately, we actually experience quite some wars uh, to happen. And, um, and lots of lives getting, getting lost in these kind of conflicts. So the fear and is kind of thinking about this this situation, but then he says also like maybe there are certain limitations to it, and he kind of continues with his thoughts to think about limit limitations, why wars are still happening, and why countries are fighting them. One of the ma major problems is called the commitment problem. So, if you find an agreement. Let's say you change of change the territory from uh, you uh, from where where you give a, a lot more. In the first example we have, you give give quite a bit more to country A, and country B gets gets less. So both countries think like, okay, this is better than the outcome of war, and therefore we will be kind of we will prefer this outcome over um, um, over the situation. But one of the problems is that both sides have to commit that actually after they kind of change the borders, this will lead to a peaceful uh, um, situation between those two. So, and not that there is a kind of a renegotiation taking place. So in this way, um, it's not possible uh, it can be that the threat can reoccur. So what kind of leads, um, what kind of stops country B after it, uh, country A after it has been so successful in the negotiations, like here at the bottom, if they get something more from, uh, from these, uh, from this kind of negotiations that didn't need to fight for it, what stops them for asking actually even more? They could ask for more afterwards. And that is something which is seen as a commitment problem. So it is difficult that a bargaining, a bargaining might be reached, but it's difficult to commit both sides to stick to this deal and not come later on and say like, oh, actually I want more. Yeah. And even more and more and more. So to give you another completely kind of random example where this is happening is uh, where this is kind of problematic is a situation of blackmail. So for example, uh, one party has done something which is not great. I don't know, maybe uh, taken some, some of the, of the lunch of their friends uh, from their friends. And they are a bit ashamed of actually uh, secretly taking it. And they're a bit ashamed of doing it. Some other students saw, saw them and told them, well, I will tell your friend that you ate their, their lunch if you don't give me some kind of candy or whatever, whatever you think of. Yeah. So in a way, the negotiation which you have with this person are like, okay, um, is it better that they, uh, to, to give away my candy or is it better that they will tell my friend very frequently? It might be better to give away some kind of candy. But since the other party has the knowledge, they can continue with asking these kind of questions and always re come back to you and say like, okay, I can tell about the lunch if you don't give me candy or something else or something else. So in a way it's difficult to commit that once you have found an agreement that it will not happen again and again and again. And by the way, this is not only difficult for the one who has to give up something, it's also difficult for the other side to say that they are not doing it. So it can be kind of uh, challenging for both sides. To give you not such a silly example, what we have at the moment, uh, what I gave is the lunch, but rather maybe more serious political kind of international relations example, we could think about North Korea again. And so we have this situation 
where North Korea dri uh, drives to get nuclear weapons, or by now properly has nuclear weapons, and the West, including uh, South Korea and Japan, would like uh, Korea, North Korea to give up these nuclear weapons. Hmm. They might actually promise something like, like economic prosperity, kind of support in, in other areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the problems which exists is that it's not clear whether there is enough commitment from both sides. So one party has to move first. So either the West gives economic support to, uh, to North Korea, so that North Korea can give up later on their nuclear weapons. If this is the case, then once uh, North Korea got all this uh, economic support, maybe they're not so inclined anymore to actually give up their nuclear weapons. So you could say like, okay, then we do it the other way around. And that is like, new, uh, North Korea has to first give up its nuclear weapons, and then it will get lots of uh, uh, economic support, etc. But here the same problem exists. So once uh, North Korea has destroyed its nuclear weapons, what's the incentive uh, for the West to actually still kind of stick up to their deal and continue giving support uh, at that stage? And this kind of situation is, is very often, especially by North Korea, kind of uh, mentioned that it's, it's not sure whether it can trust the other party. And that's not without reason. So what we can see in the in the Iran deal between the Iranians and Western countries and, and Russia and China as well, actually, uh, about uh, giving up nuclear weapons is exactly this situation. So uh, under Obama and the Obama US uh, presidency, Obama, uh, this kind of uh, deal has been negotiated with many international actors, but President Trump didn't like this this idea and uh, so he kind of uh, uh, resigned from this contract and moved back to uh, providing sanctions uh, to Iran so in a way Iran was kind of uh, then in a not great situation from themselves because they first kind of signed this agreement but afterwards didn't have the same kind of um, uh, um, opportunities from it anymore because unilaterally um, the United States uh, um, rejected to follow um, this deal. So in a way, from a commitment is really problem and credible, kind of being credible is very problematic in this way. Another problem which occurs is this idea of so-called relative power. So in a way, territory is uh, maybe has a value of itself, but it can also kind of change the power di distribution between different countries. So, for example, if some territory is kind of moving from country A to country B, then maybe country B might become stronger in the in the terms of it. It might have more economic output. It has more maybe this kind of territory is strategic and, and beneficial in, in fighting a war, etc. So kind of it might be make sense for a country to negotiate uh, um, a deal where some territory is given to the other party. But at the same time, this makes the relative power of the other country, so in this case, country B, um, stronger, and country A, the one which gave them up uh, territory, actually weaker. So the gap between these countries is widening, and that can be problematic as well, because this shift of power might le very well lead to more demands uh, in the future, because actually now um, country A, B has even a better chance to winning the war, and therefore can even better threaten the the country which has uh, A, which has given up some of its um, territory. So shifting power can create uh, concerns about getting uh, uh, taking advantage in the future. So if you kind of, you might, it might make sense now, and maybe a country is even prepared to give up some things uh, at this stage, but this can harm them in the long run because they might be asked to give more, up more and more and more. So, so in this way, it's really kind of it, uh, shifting power matters because it can make, uh, uh, yeah, shifting power matters. So, of course, power cannot only shift in terms of um, 
in terms of the actual conflict, but power can also shift in terms of external conflict, uh, external factors. For example, uh, one country could become more powerful um, by its economic means. The rise of power from China, for example, is making China more powerful, not because it is violent and is kind of suppressing its neighbors, but rather it's economic successful economically successful and therefore it has more opportunities to build uh, extend its military to build it uh, build up its capabilities in many many other areas and therefore we see something which is kind of a rising power um because it becomes yeah it's more successful and therefore it becomes in the world more powerful something like this like the, if a country is declining in power and another one is rising in power can also be problematic so not in this case of China, but in other cases, this could have been seen as a situation where countries will lead, think about whether they need to want to fight a war now or maybe kind of being in the conflict later. So, for example, in the case of Iran or North Korea, some ideas were like, would it be possible to kind of fight a war before maybe the other country has nuclear weapons? So at that time, it's much easier to kind of win a war and therefore much less costly. Yeah. And so in a way, um, this kind of power shift might also be a, a reason for, for fighting a war. Yeah. So in a way, this is very often seen in a, a situation in, in Europe or where um, we're fighting or, or, or maybe like, no, let's forget Europe. Think about this in, in the case of um, Israel versus uh, versus um, Egypt, a war which was been fought for in the 1960s, uh, where the idea was that if um, if Israel waits uh, even longer, um, uh, um, Egypt will catch up with it and become more powerful in in the in the um, action before. And so they used something like the first strike option where they started to fight the fight the war because they thought it was an, an advantage in stopping the other country to become more successful. So that's something which of course follows a different logic than what we had before about the costs of fighting. Because it's not about the individual gain for one country, but it's rather kind of the loss for the other country which is relevant. So here we have just um, um, a graphical depiction of this kind of conflict. So in the initial power distribution in the game one, what we do have is we do have this bargaining range here. And any kind of outcome is possible and maybe desirable for both parties. Yeah. But maybe there is a future conflict in the, like, like here, which then has a completely different kind of situation of power distribution and then the conflict could actually kind of again needs to be kind of evaluated about its costs and its benefit but the power distribution is very different and therefore actually actor a can win much more from uh, this situation and if we kind of think about this further actually territory of uh, actor b can be further diminished 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 always by this kind of rational of avoiding conflict, but at the same time, kind of leading uh, the country vulnerable for the future uh, situation. And that's kind of often called a hazard, um, a hazard model where you kind of want to try to avoid future um, uh, conflict by kind of standing firm and maybe fighting something at the moment. One of the last reasons which I want to mention about why uh, wars could happen is this idea about indivisible goods. So it is that the idea here is that um, some goods cannot be divided um, between uh, different actors. So let's say if, if you have like a holy sculpture, which is holy in two different religions and both want to kind of keep the uh, um, this sculpture, it's not possible just to divide it by two and say like, okay, you get one half and the other gets the other half. Why? Because then it will be broken and not be valuable at all anymore. So in a way, the idea here is that some goods might be indivisible. 
and something which is often called an indivisible good is something like oil fields, etc. Why? Because they are like liquid and they cannot be necessarily divided uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way. So even if you have like territory where oil can be found, you can divide the territory but maybe the oil fields are kind of stretching all over under the ground and then the exploitation might be very different of this and therefore it might not be possible to do. Other indivisible goods, maybe the prototype of an indivisible good is normally seen the, something like the, the, the capital of Israel and the assumed capital of a, of a, um, um, of a Palestinian state and that is um, uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a holy city, not only for, for the Jewish community, but also for the Muslim community uh, within, within, the, um, within the, the region. And therefore, it is difficult to divide it because, uh, or not, uh, some people argue it's not possible to divide it because both want to have it as their capital and their holy city. So at least on the first, uh, maybe uh, superficial view, it is not possible to divide the city into two different parts. Why? Because both want to, of course, um, have the whole of the city, including its uh, religious significantly uh, significant um, uh, features included in their capital. However, having said that, um, for me, in terms of many of the indivisible goods, it doesn't seem to be very plausible that these are, there are no possible solution. So in one way, we could think about this, um, that, um, that, uh, that the features which are kind of proposed are maybe not necessarily um, sophisticated enough. So maybe it's not possible um, to divide a, a, a capital there like Jerusalem, but it could be the capital of both countries in a way uh, that it features certain parts uh, which are predominantly used um, by one uh, country and other, other parts which are used by another. So also uh, important religious buildings can be shared in terms of the, the, the usability, either in terms of time or in terms of in, in terms of sections which are used uh, differently by different uh, religious groups. So in one way where to give you an example where an indivisible good can be well shared between different parties is if you have uh, children and uh, from a couple and the couple decides um, to divorce to go separate ways um, this is, a, um, of course, the, the children are important for both sides, the man and the, and the woman, and both want to, uh, to uh, spend time with them. But that doesn't, uh, in a way, that doesn't mean uh, that this um, has to be exclusive with the one or the other. And so they can be, um, a time can be a consideration which is, uh, which is used to share something which is initially indivisible. So in a way, very often there are features which are possible to devise goods, even if they initially seem indivisible. To give you this idea about the oil field, which can be exploited, uh, again, it can be, there can be a, a feature that the exploitation is not um, done by both parties, but maybe there is a common, uh, a common agency which is exploiting uh, the, the oil resources and then either dividing them uh, uh, proportionally between the two uh, the two actors or alternatively uh, kind of selling it and uh, uh, dividing the revenues between the two actors so i am a little bit skeptical about this this idea of indivisible goods why because i think that there are features and possibilities to overcome this um Another explanation why wars could happen besides the commitment issues and the indivisible goods is the idea of incomplete information. What do we mean with incomplete information is basically the idea here is that maybe the one side 
or, may, or both sides, uh, especially both sides, are lacking information about their capability. So a country could perceive to be very strong, but in reality, it's like a military capabilities are actually not that strong. And this kind of misperception or maybe overestimation of its own abilities can also lead to conflict. Why can it lead to conflict? Well, because if we go back um, to the slide uh, with the example here, what we can see is that maybe the expectation about the outcome of the war is very different from the different countries. They might think they might overestimate themselves or underestimate their competition and therefore expect to get a much higher gain uh, from uh, from fighting a war, then it is realistic. So in a way, um, an example for this uh, could be seen in the behavior of Iraq um, um, in the first Iraq war and the stealing with the United States. So in a way, the information wasn't clear whether the, how important Kuwait would be for the United States. And so um, it was assumed that actually the United States would not be willing to start a military conflict with Iraq, even though it warned Iraq of, um, of invading Kuwait. However, this turned out to be a misinformation uh, and this incomplete information about the perceived action of the one other party uh, led to um, uh, to uh, to this uh, kind of um, situation where we ended up with a conflict. So very often, what we do have is that a, a threat which might see it might be credible is kind of misinterpreted as not credible. So a country might say, "If you don't do A, B, C, I will start fighting you," and this can be either a bluff where the country uses tries to strategically deter the other country from doing something by bluffing to say that they will use military action, or it can be a threat which is really is real and it can be misunderstood by the other party. So incomplete information can also be a major cause, uh, reason for starting a conflict. Something very related but slightly different is the idea about asymmetric information. So I might know something about myself but not necessarily about your strengths. So in a way, that is especially true in the situations which I mentioned before, that countries are underestimating the strengths or the willingness to fight of other parties. So if I have, um, if I'm quite strong, I of course want to let the other party know that I'm strong. But at the same time, there is a real benefit, and game theory shows this quite well, there's a real benefit in over-representing your own strength, saying that you are stronger. To say this in layman terms, uh, we can see here already our expectation what the outcome of the war would be in this section, in the green section, is depending on the expectation how the war is actually ending and the costs each individual country has. So if we can misrepresent the strengths of one country plausibly uh, towards the other country, that means uh, that they would also have a different outcome in their or in the bargaining range. And therefore, there is an incentive to strategically make yourself stronger, uh, pretend to be stronger than you actually are. Having said that, um, it can, of course, also lead um, to misrepresentation of the other's position and the wrong interpretation of it. And therefore, there can be the idea that actually both sides try to pretend they are stronger to make, uh, make uh, get a better deal out of, of negotiations and they end up in a conflicting situation where there is no bargaining range left anymore and they have actually a situation where conflict occurs because of this misrepresentation. So commitment problems, indivisible goods, asymmetric information, and incomplete information as well, are the main features, Fearon would argue, are leading to, to wars, even though there would be a negotiation outcome which is preferable uh, for the actors. So as I said, 
Um, yeah, asymmetric information is a really important factor, which where uh, misrepresentation is, is happening and therefore could lead to war. So what ways are there to overcome asymmetric information? So one way is to signal yourself uh, with something which is called a costly signal. So to show that you are serious, you have to induce costs on yourself. And these kind of voluntary costs are trying that you're committed to do something. So for example, um, you can start building up your military. That is a costly move and it would kind of signal therefore to the other side that actually you're serious about it. There is a game theoretical framework and the ones who are interested in this can use it, can think about a signaling game. It's also called the beer quiche game, which is the standard way to analyze these kind of situations. But by making yourself, the, the logic is quite simple, by making yourself um, doing some costly exercises, it helps um, to show the other side that you are really serious about about your behavior. Another way um, to show you're serious is the use of economic sanctions as credible commitment. So in a way, sanctions are also often seen as hurting other parties. So if you sanction a country, then because the country had done something badly, then this is hurting, of course, the economy of the other country. With sanctions, what we mean with sanctions, just to get one step back, is that we are actually restricting the, the economic uh, um, uh, interaction with a certain country um, because of political reasons. So, for example, sanctions exist between Japan and North Korea and many other Western countries in North Korea. And that means that, um, that uh, technology, um, many, many products cannot be sold in North, uh, towards uh, in North Korea. And of course, this is harmful for the country, for North Korea as a country. But in the same way, it's also costly for the country, which is actually kind of introducing these sanctions. So in a way, uh, it's also harmful for, uh, for in this case, Japan, if sanctions are, are there between uh, Japan and North Korea, because at the end of the day, uh, Japanese companies can sell less products than they would do otherwise. And so in this way, it is harmful uh, for, the, uh, for not only uh, for North Korea, but for Japan as well. So these are, uh, uh, of course, the one who is kind of uh, setting the sanctions, is, uh, these are self-induced costs as well. So it shows that a country is committed to kind of uh, to a certain problem, and by bearing these costs, it shows that they that it is serious about it. One um, one criticism about sanction, sanctions is, of course, that it normally doesn't hit the right people because sanctions are normally not so strongly hitting the, the, the ruling classes, but more, rather the general population. But that's a little bit of a different argument, because if you see sanctions as just something, as, as a signaling that you're serious about it, then they work very well. One of the real problems, and that is the idea of the commitment problem, which I mentioned before, is that can adversaries really trust that they hold a certain deal once it is reached? So we have, we can see in a, in a conflict situation, we can see two different um, aspects. One aspect is finding a deal which both parties can agree to. And the second aspect is holding this deal and not cheating over, over it. So it could be, of course, that um, actors might increase their military in secret, not honor their agreements, uh, using the peace in some form of getting advantage, for example, replacing troops or kind of building new weapons and all kinds of things can be used. So this kind of trust uh, between the parties is a really big problem. Because very often what we have is that the re uh, agreement could be reached, but trust is not existent between the different parties. One thing which we will talk about this uh, in this way in the next class is really about using institutions like international institutions to monitor the behavior of the different parties who agreed to a deal. In this way, it's much better because then there is an external party which can monitor and see that both party, uh, both both sides are really kind of uh, keeping to what they promised, and therefore 
be much, this is much more successful. So if we want to kind of complete uh, this, this kind of section and think why do states fight wars, we can find that generally there are two ingredients. The core, um, states are in conflict with each other and there are some kind of factors which prevent states from reaching a peaceful uh, 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 solution. That's why countries fight wars. Normally they should be able to reach a peaceful agreement because there's always the bargaining range available which is necessary um, to uh, which is necessary to reach an agreement but because of the cost of war that should always be available. However, Afiran introduced three really big problems uh, which, which we keep in mind why states at the end still end up fighting in a, in a dispute rather than, than finding an agreement. One is incomplete or asymmetric information so that we don't know what are the strengths of the other party or over or underestimate them or strategically uh, a party is lying over their own, own strengths in order to get a better deal. Two commitment problems. We don't know whether countries will be able um, to, to commit to a deal which they're actually kind of striking and maybe they will, uh, will break it in the future. And the worry about this is leading to not having a deal at all. Or three, what's something called indivisible goods. So that the, actually the good the conflict is about is so difficult or impossible to, to, to split up between the two parties um, that they can only fight about the good and not uh, find a, a peaceful solution. However, having said this indivisible good argument, I feel like is not very strong and only in very rare cases actually exists. Well, now that one side note I would like to mention here is maybe thinking about ways to make wars less likely. One of the technical aspects of, of, of doing this is by raising the costs of war. So we have thought about the deterrence. So the bigger, basically the green section in the negotiations, let me go back to this, to this slide. The bigger the green section here is um, the, between PA and PB, the costs of fighting wars, the less, the more likely we are that we find a negotiation outcome and we don't need to find wars. So having, it might sound counterintuitive, but having very high costs of war is leading to a higher likelihood that countries come to a negotiation outcome. Think about this in one way, like nuclear deterrence. If both countries have nuclear weapons, they don't want to fight a war because there's the risk that they use the nuclear weapons and these nuclear weapons will destroy the other country or maybe even the whole planet. So in this way, the, the costs become infinitely high. By increasing the cost for a conflict, the incentive to reach a, 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 a peaceful agreement or the peaceful but a bargaining agreement is becoming higher and higher and higher. However, this is also kind of uh, as a side note. So if war becomes very cheap, very easy to fight, maybe actually wars become more, more common. Another aspect is an allowing escalation mechanisms to show countries that they are really serious and therefore reducing the problems of incomplete information. Of course, in the same direction is the idea to increase transparency. This is also leading to in more or less incomplete information and very good are third parties um, uh, who, from the outside to enforce the negotiation agreement, but also to provide information and transparency to the different sides. And the, third, the last point here is to find ways, smart ways to divide apparently indivisible goods, as I said. Um, something where in, in between Germany and France and the uh, and, uh, uh, wars have been fought over hundreds of years are big coal and steel mines where production of coal and steel in, this, in the first and the second world war was a key kind of feature um, for, the, for the countries and so fights over this territory became very important. However, at the end of the second world war 
uh, France, Germany, and the Benelux land, uh, countries decided to actually uh, form a new insti intergovernmental institution, the European Coal and Steel Community, where they shared the revenues from this coal and steel and also kind of um, uh, shared the benefit from it. So this institution was so successful that it actually merged into the European Economic Community and later into the European Union as we know it today, which is maybe one of the most successful regional corporations in the world. And so we do see that uh, indivisible goods, if done well, can be divided well and also lead to more harmonious um, behavior between countries. One last uh, thought I want to kind of add at the end, rather as an add-on than, than, than a key point, is that uh, there are more and more new scholars which think about um, um, uh, fighting wars or at least like mild military conflict as part of the negotiations. So it could be that fighting is actually seen as a costly signal to show how severe you are. As, this is especially true, not necessarily for all all out wars where countries try to conquer other countries, but for limited military conflict, which is actually kind of slow escalations and and which help to kind of uh, kind of show how how serious a country is. To give you an example, um, what the military conflict between I, I, the India and China in the Himalayan region in recent months, uh, both parties have clashed there uh, several times, but not necessarily in a situation which could lead to an all-out war, but rather to kind of indicate to the other party that this area is really important for them and that they are serious in this. So in this way, we could see um, military actions uh, or conflict as a part of, of the negotiation procedure to uh, eliminate asymmetric information. So this is now again the conclusion why states fight wars. Yeah, incomplete information, com uh, asymmetric information commitment series are the real kind of uh, um, difficulties to overcome. We could understand military conflict as a part of negotiations. However, this is a completely new research area and we need to do more to kind of say this definitely. Um, but what we need to think more about, and that is maybe my last point here, is that uh, we need mechanisms to reduce the risk of military conflict. So knowing that generally speaking, military conflict is a suboptimal situation and only by certain problems is, uh, uh, arises, gives us hope that maybe if our institutional settings like international institutions or others are becoming better and better in mediating in conflict that we actually see a considerable reduction of military conflict. So that's it for me uh, for, for this class. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I look very much forward to our class uh, to discuss even further uh, this kind of models, but also the ideas about um, how conflict occurs, how conflict um, escalates into military conflict and what, uh, what we, how we can think about the, um, the avoidance of, of these kind of conflicts. So until then, take care and have a nice week. Bye-bye.